Uh, we're back, and this is uh, part four of the introduction to anatomy and physiology. And what we want to do is talk in, in this uh, presentation a couple special things. And these are uh, various terms that are going to be coming up for the rest of the semester, the terms you really have to know. And so basically, we want to get into a lot of body terminology. What we're going to be talking about is regional names. And also, I want to add in here something else, directional, directional terms. These are really important. I don't think that there was ever a day in the clinic I didn't use regional names and directional terms, at least in some, some way, shape, or form. We're also going to talk about body cavities, because the body is a number of different cavities. We want to talk about what those cavities are, how we divide them. And those cavities have to be lined with something. So guess what's lined with, what they're lined with? They're lined with body membranes. So I'm going to tell you a little about those body membranes. So a couple things. Now, we're going to start at the very beginning. Okay, And now this is absolutely, absolutely, absolutely critical. And what I'm talking about as being really critical is this area up in here called anatomical position. Okay. Now, if we were in class, I'd go around and say, OK, uh, what's your favorite fruit? And somebody's going to say, I like uh, apples, and I like grapes, and I like bananas, and you know, I like peaches, and stuff like that. And I said, well, which is best? I'd say, let's take a vote and see which is best. And, People say, well, how can you, you compare? Um, they're all fruit, but they all have different characteristics. So, and that's the same thing when I talk about body positions, directions, and stuff like that. It all relates to some type of common frame of reference. So in other words, when I relate the position of one thing to something else, it all has to be related, relatable by what we call a body frame of reference. And that's what we call anatomical position, okay? Anatomical position, is sort of like an arbitrary position, and this right here is anatomical position. Okay? Every time I talk about a certain directional term, how one thing will relate to something else in anatomical position. How one thing relates to something else in anatomical position. This is what anatomical position is. The body's upright, okay? The palms are facing forward, okay? The backs of the hand are facing backwards. The head's upright, knees are fully extended, the arms at the sides. The arms down are, aren't out here, but they're down at the sides. So basically, this is someone who's standing upright. The ankle is going to be at 90 degrees. The knees fully extended. The body is upright. The head's upright and looking forward. The arms are down at the side. The palms are facing forward. And that's what we call anatomical position. Okay, remember that. That's anatomical position. Okay, upright, head head upright, face eyes facing forwards, arms to the side, knees fully extended, ankles bent to 90 degrees, feet flat on the floor, legs together, our side palms forward. Basically, that's what we call anatomical position. And again, this is just sort of an arbitrary position that sort of says, when I relate the position of one thing to the other, it creates a common frame of reference. So it makes sense, okay? So that's what we call anatomical position. That's the first word, the first, and probably one of the more important words you want to talk about. So everybody should know what anatomical position is. Take a good look at that and print that in your mind. I have dreams about that tonight and you'll be fine. Okay. The second word I want to talk about in regards to what we want you know, to talk about today is something that's prone versus supine. They're opposite each other. Okay. Now let's look at anatomical position. In anatomical position, the front of the body is facing forward. The front of the body is facing forward. Okay. If the front of the body is, was the, the front of the body that's facing forward is facing downwards. Such as someone's lying, here's their rear end, here's their legs, here's their feet. Heads like this, here's their nose, I guess. Lying down, okay, what they are is said to be prone. So if I take that anatomical position and take that anterior portion and have it facing downward, okay, downward, that's called prone position. So if somebody's in a prone position, they're facing downward, so lying on their stomach, basically. Someone is supine, supine means they're lying on their back. So now the ground would be here and they're looking upwards, okay? So if they're lying on their back with anatomically, the, the things are in the front anatomical position facing upwards, that's supine. If they're laying facing downwards, that's prone, okay? Um, a lot of times, uh, I know when I dictate an operative, operative report, I say a patient was taking the operating room, placed on the operating table in a supine position, which means they were laying on their back, okay? So those things have to be described. So supine means lying on your back with the anterior portion facing upwards, or the front facing upwards, and prone means lying on your stomach, the anterior portion facing down. Those are horrible pictures. I apologize in advance, but guess what? They didn't hire me to 
to be an artist. So you know, I don't you know spooky stuff. For me. Okay. So anyway, that's that. So that's called anatomical position, prone and supine. Okay. That should be pretty easy to figure out. Anatomical position, like we have the picture, and prone. If the front is facing downwards, such as lying on the stomach, that's a prone position. If the front is facing upwards, that's a supine position. Same hand, same thing is. Let's think about this. Let's look at the palms. Look at the palms, okay? In the palms, okay, the palms in anatomical position are facing what? Forward. So if my hand is in a position like this with my palm facing down, my hand is in a prone position or called pronated. If my hand is turned this way where the front is facing upwards, that would be called, whoops, there, get over there, there you go. It'd be called a supine, the, the arm would be supinated or the hand would be in a supine position facing upwards. So anything that's frontwards facing upwards is supine or supinated. Everything that is full, uh, is in the front facing downwards is prone or pronated. Okay, both of those words can be used. Okay, so that's what we mean about anatomical position, prone and supine. What I want to talk about now, and, and you have to understand that, uh, hopefully you still have that indelible picture of that person in anatomical position standing there. So I want to talk about some words here, okay? And these are directional terms. Again, they never went by when I did use at least a couple of these words. These were words that are commonly used all the time. So let's talk about these words and what they mean. Now, most of these words are paired. So if you know one, the other one means just the opposite, okay? Let's take the first one, superior, cephalic, and cranial. And then if we compare that to inferior or caudal, these two are opposites to each other. Superior means towards the top of the body. Oops, I should have done that in yellow, shouldn't I? Just to be consistent with what we have to do. Towards the top of the body. In which, and another word for superior is also phallic or cranial. Phallic or cranial also means the top. Okay. So anything that's closer to the top of the body is superior cephalic or cranial. Anything that's closer to the bottom of the body, closer to the bottom of the body, would be called inferior, come on green, it's called inferior or caudal. Now, to be superior doesn't mean it has to be at the head. It just means it has to be in the body something that's higher than something else. Typical example, I can always say my head is superior to my neck, which it is, okay? But I can also say that my knee is superior to my ankle because it's closer to the top of the body. It's higher. So if something is higher is called superior or cephalic or, or cranial. If something is closer to the bottom of the body, it's called inferior or caudal. I could always say that my chin is in, is is um, uh, uh, inferior to my to my nose, even though it's not at the bottom of the body. It's still lower in the body, so therefore it's going to be inferior. Okay. So superior cephalic cranial. Something that's closer to the top of the body, inferior or caudal, something that's closer to the bottom of the body. It's usually a term related to one thing in relationship to something else. Something is either superior, cephalic or cranial, or some, and the other thing is probably inferior or caudal. Okay? The next two words are also paired. The next two words are also paired. Anterior is one, and posterior, whoops, that's bad, that's a bad call. Uh, let's use this one here. Uh, posterior or dorsal. Anterior ventral means towards the front of the body. If something's closer to the front of the body, it's called anterior or ventral. Anterior or ventral. If something's closer to the back of the body, it's called posterior or dorsal. Now, this is pretty simple to remember. So all I got to do is remember one thing. Um, I don't know about you guys. Have you ever been swimming like out in the ocean? And what do you look for? Sharks. How do you know it's a shark? A dorsal fin. Where's the dorsal fin? On the back. Okay, so if they think dorsal and posterior it'll relate those two together, they mean something that's closer to the back of the body. Something that's anterior or ventral is closer to the front of the body. But a little Nemo with those little ventral fins going like that too. I mean, that's another thing too. So anyway, uh, and the Nemo could get swallowed by that big shark with that big dorsal fin. So anyway, anterior means the anterior or ventral means to the front of the body. Posterior or dorsal means towards the back. And that's a relationship with one thing to another. Okay, and so these two are opposite as well. The next two words that we have down here, and let me get rid of those other those other words. Let's get let's go to the next one here. And this next one here is called medial and lateral. Okay, and they are also opposites. Okay, now the way to best the best way to look at medial and lateral is let's take this line right down the middle. Now this is a 
line that we talked about before. And that, remember we talked about the sagittal plane, mid-sagittal plane? We said there's also another word that's called the midline. The midline is the line, a line that comes right down the middle of the body. If something is closer to the midline, it's called medial. If something is further away from the midline, it's called lateral. So if it's closer to the midline, it's medial. If it's further away, it's called lateral. Okay? I could say my uh, ear is lateral to my eyes, which it is. Okay? Because my eyes are right are close to the midline, but they're because they're closer, the eyes would be medial to my ears, or my ears would be lateral to my eyes. Makes sense. Okay? So if something is closer to the midline, it's called medial. If something is further away from the midline, it's called lateral. You know, and it's and, and those are those are probably easy. You know, if it's close, if you remember midline, midline sounds like medial. And if midline sounds like medial, something that's closer to the midline is going to be is going to be medial, and something that's further away from the midline could be called lateral. You can see that in the little diagram up on the top, which says lateral, medial, and stuff like that. So if it's close to the midline, medial. If some if the, if the second thing is is further away from the midline, it's called lateral. Again, relationship of two things paired to each other, one thing to the other. Okay, the next word is a single word, okay, and that's immediate. Immediate just means right next to something. So if something's immediate to something, I have something here and something like sitting right on top of it, that'd be called immediate. Okay, so immediate would be that. Okay, so that's not a big one, so let's get rid of that. The next two words are paired. These two words, ipsilateral and contralateral, are paired. Now, we have two of most things, okay. I have two arms, I have two legs. However, I have one arm on the right side, one arm on the left side, one leg on the right side, one leg on the left side. Makes sense. If I have a problem in two extremities or anything on the same, if anything, it's easy to explain with extremities, but it could be anything in the body. Two things that are on the same side of the body. If I have two things that are on the same side of the body, they're called ipsilateral. They're called ipsilateral. If I have one thing on one side of the body and the other thing on the other side of the body, they're called contralateral. Contra means against, you know? So if, if I have two things that are on the same side of the body, over here, like see, here's point number one and point number two, they're on the same side, those would be ips, those would be ipsilateral, okay? But if I had point one up there and I had point two over here, these two are on opposite sides of the body, so they would be called contralateral. Same side of the body, ipsilateral. Opposites, two things opposite side of the body, contralateral. Okay? So that's not a bad word to figure out. Okay? Let's go to the next two. And those two are also paired. The next two are also paired. Proximal, distal. Now these sometimes get people a little screwed up in the brain. Okay? And I'll explain to you why that happens in the middle. Because what happens, is they sometimes will confuse uh, medial and lateral with proximal and distal and it's not like that at all okay let's look at this and let's look at this extremity here let's take this extremity up here and let's go let's say this is where the arm starts and this is where the arm ends if i have two points something is, that is closer to here is called proximal something that is further away on an extremity is called distal okay proximal and distal and that makes sense okay because I could use those words pretty easy. Proximal sounds like proximity. What does proximity mean? Real close to something. Something is close. Yeah, it's in the proximity, which means it's it's really close. On the other hand, if something's further away, it's called distant. Distant. Okay. So if you can remember distant and prox proximity, you remember distal being further away and proximal being closer. Typical example. Okay, let's see if you understand this. What what's the relationship of the wrist? To the elbow well i could say it two ways i could say the wrist is distal to the elbow because it's further away or i could say the elbow is proximal to the wrist because it's closer to where the origin of that limb would be okay so that's proximal and distal and again that shows that a little bit by if something's closer to where things start it's proximal if something's further away it's distal and that's comparing two things with each other again okay so hopefully that's not too much of a problem these are words you have to know you have to know. No questions about them. You have to know. Okay, these are common words, and radiographically, these are thrown out all the time. Uh, I need an X-ray. I need I need the X-ray to be a little bit dis more distal than what you show me. Okay, you take an X-ray, and there's something that they don't see. They say, "Hey, can you get another shot that's a little bit more distal?" You say, mm, "Geez, I forgot. I better go back and look that one up," which means it'll be further away, further down, farther out of the extremity. Okay.
Okay, so that's an important word to know. A couple other words we need to know here are superficial and deep. Duh. Doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure this one out. If something's superficial compared to something else, it's closer to the surface. If something is deep, it's further away from the surface. Go figure that one. I mean, I mean, I would I don't think I hope you don't have to spend a whole lot of time thinking about that. If you are, um, we're gonna be in for a long semester. So superficial means closer to the surface of the body. Something that is deep would be deeper to the body. Okay. So these are some directional terms, which all of these are exceptionally important. Every one of these are used. Uh, learn these, know these, get used to them right now because guess what? They're going to be popping up all the time. So please learn these words. These words are exceptionally important. Let's go now and talk about some regional names. We give names to things. We can't say, oh, that little bump on the back of the elbow. That's not a good thing. That's not a good medical term. Bump on the back of the elbow or those little fingery things. You know, no, that's not a good word. We have to use some words. It's not that we're trying to confuse people, but we're trying to make these medical terms be relatively precise. Okay, so we're going to go through each of these areas. We're going to go through the head. You know, we're going to we're going to go through the uh, the head. We're going to go through the neck. We're going to go through the trunk, the upper limbary, the lower extremity, and we'll mention a couple other things beside that. Okay, so let's go each of those individually. Let's first talk about the head and neck. The head and neck. Okay, and these are words again. You have to know. There's a bunch of words here, and you really have to know. Most of them are pretty simple. Most of them are actually very easy. First one's going to be cranium. Okay. Cranium is basically the area up in here that contains the brain. This whole area here, the top part of the skull, is going to be called the cranium. Okay, so the brain sits inside that cranium. So that would be the cranium. Okay, so that's an easy one. You shouldn't have to worry too much about that one. Cranium, the area on the top of the head where the brain sits. Okay, facial. Hmm. Let me think about this one a while. Huh. Shouldn't take a rocket scientist to figure this one out. Facial area. Anything that's in the face is called facial. Okay. But when we talk about muscles, there are a number of muscles that will actually control. They're called muscles of facial expression. So when you wink and you raise your eyebrows and make kind of funny faces and stuff like that, you're using muscles of facial expression because that's the face. Piece of cake. Piece of cake. Facial means piece of face. Okay. If you if if, if you miss that one on an exam, um, maybe there's a you know a cosmetology school or something like that you could go to or something like that. But, you know, anyway, so hopefully you won't miss that. I don't expect anybody here to miss that one. Okay, let's talk about the next word here. The next word's frontal. Frontal is this area right here. This area right here is called the frontal region. And basically it's where the forehead, the forehead's the frontal region. There's a muscle underneath there. If, you, if, you, if you're thinking about now, you take your eyes and raise your eyebrows. Lift, lift, lift your eyebrows up. You see those wrinkles on the forehead? The muscle that does that, ooh, it's called the frontalis, the frontalis muscle. So the frontal area in the forehead is called the frontal region. So the, there's a muscle right underneath there that actually wrinkles the forehead. That's called the frontalis. So the forehead region is called the frontal region. Okay. On the other hand, the back of the head back here is called the occipital region. The occipital region is back here, back in the very back of the head. If you feel the back of your head, go ahead and feel it. You know, you can do that. I mean, I'll let you do that. If you feel the back of the head, you know, it's hard to see right back in here. There's a little bump back there. There's a little bump back there. And that's called the external occipital protuberance because it's at the top of the occipital bone. The occipital bone is one of the lower bones of the skull that's actually very, in the very back. The uh, occipital lobe of the brain that sits back in here, guess what it controls? Vision, okay? So that's where our vision is perceived in the back of the brain back here in this occipital lobe. So the back of the head back here is called the occipital region, the occipital region. So it's so frontal in the front, occipital in the back. It's interesting because what happens is if you've ever seen somebody who had a, a, a laceration of their scalp, they bleed like fish. If like, oh my gosh, they're going to bleed out. You're going to need a transfusion. They don't need a transfusion. Well, what happens is that the frontal muscle, the, or the, excuse me, the frontalis muscle, you know, the frontalis muscle here that wrinkles the forehead, actually is connected by a band of tissue. Get out of here. It's connected by a band of tissue that goes all the way to the back, and it meets up with another muscle back here called the occipitalis, and they're actually together. This, muscle, this band of tissue is called the epicranial aponeurosis. You don't remember that. But this, the frontal muscle is actually attached to the back with the occipital muscle. So go figure that. Okay. So back of the head is called the occipital region. Okay. So now we're that far. Orbital. Okay. Orbital is this area right here. The orbital region. It's around the eye. So the area around it's a bed. It's a bed. Around the eye, that's the orbital region. Okay. So um, the, there's a muscle that's in there that helps to close the eye. It's called the orbicularis oculi. 
orbicularis oculi because it's or orbital. It goes around the, around the eye. Um, socket that the eye fits in in the, in the in the skull is called the orbit. Okay, so basically, are the you know the eye sockets the orbit? So orbital means the eye, it's the eye region. Okay, so now we've got that to get further. Otic or auricular, otic or auricular, and that's this area here. Otic or auricular is this area. Should be quite a bit It's probably is this is this area right here, otic or auricular. Otic means ear, and auricular means this big flappy thing that sits out there, the big earlobe, or not the, just the earlobe, but the whole ear. That's called the oracle. The oracle. It's like a horn that will actually um, collect sound waves and sends it down through that that, that auditory canal that goes down the eardrum right in there. Okay. So this is called the otic region or the auricular region. Otic or auricular. Okay, uh, when people have uh, eardrops, when they when they write a prescription for eardrops, they're basically otic drops because basically they're in their ear, um, like a you know a course for an otic drops, and there's something you put in your ear. Nasal, hmm. Do I have to tell you what nasal is? I don't want to insult your intelligence. Obviously, we know that nasal means that. Okay, that's enough of that. We don't need more of that. Buckle, buckle, buckle is an interesting one. Buckle is this area right here. Okay, it's the cheek. Buckle means the cheek. Okay. If you take your finger and stick it inside your cheek, you know, uh, sometimes you bite it with your teeth when you bite and stuff like that. Or if you get if you get uh, some uh, local anesthetic for dental work, you keep on biting inside your cheek for a while. Uh, the inside is called the buccal mucosa. When they actually do uh, a chromosomal testing, when they're looking for DNA, what they do is they swab. They do what's called a buccal swab. They actually take and swab the inside of the cheek, and that takes some cells off the inside of the cheek. There's a muscle that's right here that holds the cheek tight against the teeth and that's called the buccinator so the buccinator buckle buckle mucosa they're all the same okay so buckle means cheek means cheek buckle means cheek okay so remember that one the next one is oral mm, guess what oral we know that oral means okay that's easy you don't have to think about that one much more than, than three seconds okay uh, which guess which one will not be on the exam okay oral um, next one is mental now mental people will think oh it has to have to do with the brain it doesn't the mental region is this area right down here, the chin. If the chin is called the mental region, in fact, there's a little muscle right here at the bottom of the chin, this chin that's called the mentalis, the mentalis region, okay, or the mentalis muscle, in the mental region. So that's mental right there. Okay. So basically, that's what we have. A couple other terms that we don't have here. This area right here is called the temporal region. In the area of the temple, they call it the temple because it's called in the temporal region. Up here at the side of the skull, the side of the cranium, is called the parietal region. Okay, so that's pretty much tells me everything I need to know on this particular. Oh, one more thing. Oop, I forgot. Cervical and nuchal. Cervical and nuchal means neck. Means neck. So if I if you hear the word cervical or nuchal, it means neck. When somebody has meningitis, they frequently have what they call nuchal rigidity. What would that be? Neck. Okay, and, but nuchal rigidity sounds a lot more. They probably charge a lot more because they say nuchal rigidity is compared to stiff neck. Sounds sounds much more impressive. Okay, that's what the education will do for you. Anyway, so cervical or nuchal means neck. And in fact, what happens to the vertebrae that are in the back of the neck? They're called the cervical vertebrae. If you don't know. We'll talk about that later on. Okay, so those are some specific regional names of the head. Okay, the thorax is not there's not as much here. Okay, in the, in the thorax, the first word sternal. The sternal is basically going to be the breastbone area. Sternal means the breastbone area. That's a piece of cake. You know, the breastbone is called the sternum. There's actually three parts of the sternum. Upper part called the manubrium, the bigger part called the body, and the little thing that we talked about in our uh, number three, okay, our introduction to ANP number three, um, was basically called the xiphoid when we did those lines. That's right down here. So the sternal region is basically where the breastbone is, the sternum, okay? That's sternal. Mammary, mammary is obviously the area around the breast. The breast area would be called the mammary region. Okay. Mammogram, that should be easy to figure out. You wouldn't have to worry about that too much. Axillary. Axillary means armpit. It means armpit. So the armpit region is called the axillary region. Axillary region, the armpit region. Okay. Um, uh, when, when females have a breast cancer, what happens is they, the breast cancer frequently spreads to lymph nodes in the axillary region or what they call axillary nodes. Okay. So the armpit region is called the axillary region. That would mean that as well. A chromial. A chromial is the top of the shoulder. Is this area right here, the very top of the shoulder, we call the chromial region. Chromial region right here. 
And if you feel your shoulder, there's a hard bump right in the top, okay? If you, if you feel your collarbone, which is your clavicle, and, can, and sort of walk it out over towards the top of the shoulder, eventually you get to the end, at the end, it's sort of hard right there. That is called the acromion process of the, of the scapula. Scapula sits down here and has this acromion process that goes up over the top of the shoulder. So the top of the shoulder, right in here, right here, right here, and right here is the acromial region. Okay, so that's where acromial is working right now. Okay, scapular. Scapular is on the back, and that's the shoulder blade. So if I look back in here, scapula sits right back in here like this, scapula sits right there. And that'd be the scapular region. So that'd be the scapular region, the shoulder blade region. Okay? We'll talk a lot about the scapula later on because you know what? It sounds like a really simple muscle or a simple bone, but it's really complex. There's lots of little nooks and crannies, a lot of little nice things on it. Okay. A lot of things you have to think about, and learn, you know, because there's a lot, it's not just a, a flat bone or a round bone, it's really sort of fun. Okay. So I like the scapula. Scapula is one of my favorites. Okay. We'll talk about the scapula later on. Vertebral. Vertebral obviously means the vertebrae, okay? So the vertebral area right here, that would be the vertebral area, which is basically the vertebrae, okay? There shouldn't be any problems with those. Those are all pretty simple, simple terms. Let's go to the abdomen, okay? Now, some of these we've already talked about, okay? First one we talked about before was the umbilical region. Umbilical region means the navel or the belly button region, okay? That area right there would be the umbilical or the navel region. Okay, umbilical, umbilical, navel, whatever, I don't care what you call it, somewhere in that range, in that range. that's the umbilical region, okay? Coxal, coxal actually means the hip, means the hip region. This area is basically the coxal region at the top of the hip right here. So I, it probably, I think they probably should have put it more in the leg than in, the, in this, but that's called the coxal region, okay? So that's that. Inguinal region, so let's get rid of these that we've already shown and already drawn here, let's get rid of that stuff. And let's look at the inguinal region, okay? And we talked a little bit about this in one of the previous discussions. This area right here is called the inguinal region, okay? Inguinal region for the groin. And this is an area where, again, uh, where the testes that start in the abdomen, they actually work down their way through the inguinal canal. It's actually a, a tunnel in the lower abdominal wall in males. And they can actually feel it, okay? You can actually feel the hole, the, the entrance, the, the, the hole that would be, be, there's a small little hole, like right, here, a little hole right here, which is called the, oops, get out of there, external, get out of there, external ring, okay? And what happens is that's where the, uh, the, the actually the vas, the, the vas deferens, the stuff that carries the spermatozoa where they do a vasectomy, actually goes up into the abdomen through that little hole, through that canal, and goes over the top of the bladder to the back of the bladder to take that spermatozoa on a very long voyage, okay? So that's called the inguinal region down here in the lower groin region, it's inguinal region. Okay. Lumbar region. Lumbar region is the lower back region. Okay, so this lower back region in here is called the lumbar region. Okay. Lumbar region. Back in here, the vertebrae back in here are the lumbar vertebrae. I drew that too high. Okay, so if I look here, this back in here where the lumbar vertebrae, there's five lumbar vertebrae. This area would be the lumbar region, and that area, the lower back region. Okay, piece of cake. Let's go to the upper extremity. Okay, upper extremity has a few words I think are important. Brachial. Brachial is this blue area right here. So if I'm looking, this area right here is the brachial region, the upper arm. Um, the muscle that actually flexes the elbow, that big muscle in the front, I'd show you, but I don't want to take my jacket off. Well, if I show you this, this big muscle that's right here, it's called the biceps brachii, biceps brachii. The one in the back is called the triceps brachii. Why? Because it's in the brachial region. So the brachium is that area right there, is called that area right there, okay? That's the brachium, okay? Uh, antecubital is the next word. Antecubital is this area in front of the elbow right here. It's in the front, not in the back. It's in the front of the elbow. Antecubital is in the front of the elbow, the front of the elbow. When they take blood from people, they usually go to the veins. They're in the antecubital fossa. It's antecubital reason to take a vein from in there. So that's called antecubital, which is in the front of the elbow. Antibrachial. Antibrachial is this area out here, it's right here. Anti means in front of or before. So anti in front of the brachium, brachium is there, there's up, oh, it's in front of the brachium. That's why they call it antibrachial. So the antibrachial region is the forearm, is the forearm, okay? The carpal region. In the wrist, okay, in this area down here, whoops, get out of there. In this area down here, there's eight small little bones and they're called the carpal bones. And they allow my wrist to do 
this type of motion. Okay, I can try to figure out where my camera is. Do this type of motion. And basically, they're the carpal bone. So the wrist bones are called the carpal bones. The wrist is the carpal bones. Okay? Palmer. Palmer means the palm. Means the palm. Front of the hand. It's called the palmer region. It's called the palm. Okay? So palmer means the hand. The fingers out here are called digital. Digital. Okay? Sometimes they're also called phalangeal. So phalangeal or digital can both be used for the areas of the fingers. And we'll talk about the phalanges down the road. Dorsum, okay? Dorsum means the back of the hand. The back of the hand means to, is, the, is the dorsal region. Back of the hand is, hand is the dorsal region, okay? And in the back of the elbow, up in here, it's called the electromal region. It's a small little part of the ulna, which comes up there. The little funny bone that you feel back there, that bone, that's the electron process of the ulna. And so it's, it's the back of the elbow, and that's called the electromal region, electromal region. One other area I probably could show up in here would be this area up in here. And this is called the deltoid region. And the deltoid, the acromial is gonna be up in here. And right here is called the deltoid. This large muscle right here, that's like a V-shaped muscle over the top of the shoulder, that shoulder gap is basically called the, is the deltoid, okay? Another a couple words that we should talk about here, manus. You see the word manus? Manus means hand, you know? Man, if something's manual. What does manual mean? You have to work it with your hand. So manus means hand, okay? There's another word for the thumb. And the thumb word for thumb is P-O-L-L, -L, it's an O, L-L-I-X, pollux. Pollux means thumb, okay? So if you see the word pollux, it means thumb, okay? So these are basically the upper extremity words that are important for you to know, okay? And they're all there and stuff like that. Remember the deltoid I added on there, manus and pollux. Those are some I added on to what we have already have here. Okay, let's go to the lower extremity. The lower extremity has a lot. You know, there's a lot of words down here. Oh my gosh. Okay, let's start with the first one, pubic. The area right here in the front of the pelvis, right here, where the pelvis comes together, is called the pubic region or the pubis. Okay, it's right in the front. What happens is the pelvis actually has three bones on each side that actually fuse together to create one solid bone on each side. Okay, and that's called the pelvis. Elvis has three parts. One big part, the wing that we feel inside, it's called the ilium. The thing that you sit on, like if you're sitting on a hard bench, like at a football game, you're sitting on a bench, you have to keep on moving your butt around because it's getting sore. Those little bumps on the bottom, that's called the ischium. But where it comes together in the front, where the pelvis comes together in the front, is called the pubis. The pubis would be this area right in here, okay? Sacral. Sacral would be this area right here. And if we if we look at it, when we start to talk about the vertebrae, the sacral, the sacrum, okay, is part of the lower portion of the vertebral column, which sits down in that area. And that's called the sacral region. The sacral region. Okay. Buttock. I really have to tell you what buttock region is. This is the buttock. That's the buttock. That's it. Let me get rid of that. That's I don't like that. we get arrested for that. So anyway, the buttock is the butt region, obviously. Everybody knows what buttock is. Femoral. Femoral is the thigh. This area in here is called the femoral region, both front and back. And the reason why is the bone that sits in there is the femur. The femur is there. It's a big bone, just the largest in the bone in the body. That's called the femoral, That's called the femoral region. Okay. Let's get rid of those. Let's get rid of the femur. Let's get rid of the, the pubis. Let's get rid of the sacrum and stuff like that. So next word we have is patellar. Patellar means the kneecap. Kneecap. That's the patellar region. So that's the anterior surface of the knee is called the patellar region. Okay. The kneecap, the name for the kneecap is the patella. Okay. Patella. Next word I have down here, let's get rid of femur, let's get rid of the patella and stuff like that. The next word I have down here is curl. Curl. Curl means the front, means the shin, the front of the leg, the shin. The calf region in the back is called surl. It's called surl. Curls in the back, curls in the front, okay? In fact, in the back, when you see those big bulgy muscles in the back calf regions, which is called the gastrocnemius, underneath the gastrocnemius is another muscle called you know, called, called the soleus. And the soleus and the gastro come together and they form one large tendon that goes down to the heel bone, which is called the Achilles tendon. Well, there's two heads to the gastro, head here, head here, and then there's this, and there's this, this soleus inside. They take those three Muscles put them together, two heads of the gastroc and soleus, and they sometimes call that the triceps surrey, the triceps surrey. So the front of the shin is curl, the calf is surrey, okay? The top of the foot is called the dorsum, it's called the dorsum, 
So the top of the foot is called the dorsum. The bottom of the foot is called the plantar surface. Here's a, hey, I've had a planter's work. Sounds like I had to be a farmer or a gardener or something like that. No, it doesn't have anything to do with planting. Plantar means the bottom of the foot. So the warts on the bottom of the foot. Top of the foot, dorsum, bottom of the foot, plantar. The heel region is called calcaneal, calcaneal. The large bone that sits in the back of the heel is called the calcaneus. It's called the calcaneus. So that bone back there is called the calcaneus. The back of the heel is called the calcaneal region. In the top of the foot, underneath the ankle, the ankle area and below, it's called the tarsal region, the tarsal region. They call it that, but it's not quite accurate because the tarsal bones start below the at, at the ankle joint and below. Um, so, but the, but that's called the, the, the tarsal tarsal region. Okay, and we'll talk more about that later on. And on the both sides of the ankle, if you feel down and real, and, and now you're doing some living anatomy on yourself. I'm thinking, okay, if you feel down, there's a bump on the inside of your ankle and a bump on the outside of the ankle. Those are called malleoli. Malleoli would be plural. Malleolus would be singular. Malleoli would be plural. Okay, let me write that down here so you can actually see what that word looks like. M a L L E O L I or L U S, whatever one. Okay, and those are the bumps on the inside, and the outside the ankle, and they're basically the long, long lower leg bones. Okay, so basically that's what the malleoli. So that's talking about some uh, regional names. Those names are very important, especially radiographically, because you know people are going to get X-rays and they're going to say, where do you want the X-ray of? And they're going to give you a name and what they're looking at, and basically you got to know. So by, by all means, start memorizing them and memorize them well, okay? A couple other things. Let's talk about body cavities now. We've got a couple more things we've got to talk about before we finish. Let's talk about body cavities. Basically, we have two main body cavities. Um, remember Rocky? You know, Rocky's in that in the freezer and he's punching the sides of the beef. You see the inside of the sides of the beef all hollowed out. Well, that's a cavity. The body has a number of cavities. What do you think the cavity is for? For an organ to sit inside. Okay, so an organ to sit inside. So we have two major major body cavities. One's called the dorsal body cavity, and one's called the ventral body cavity. Now the dorsal body cavity is a piece of cake. It's a piece of cake. Okay? The dorsal body cavity is basically the brain. You see that's yellow over yellow in the spinal cord. That's all. The dorsal body cavity is the cavity that's enclosed within the cranium. Okay, so we have the cranium and cavity to read it up. Right? Okay. It's in there. So that's the brain and the spinal cord. The brain and the spinal cord fill the dorsal body cavity. That's it. In the vertebrae, there's a hole in the center of the vertebrae. The vertebrae have a body, a body that sits out here like this, and they have an archway that goes around the outside. You feel that bump in the back. You feel that little bump. That's called the spinous process. You know, there's a couple of bumps on the side. And there's a hole right in the center, and that's where the spinal cord goes down there. So the cavity right down the middle of the vertebrae, and basically that's that vert that's called the vertebral canal. And that's where the spinal cord goes down. So the dorsal body cavity encloses the brain and spinal cord. That's it. Nothing else. Forget that. Once the nerves leave the spinal cord, they're no longer there. Okay. Brain and spinal cord, dorsal body cavity. Thank you. Okay. The ventral body cavity is a lot more difficult. Okay. The ventral body cavity is divided into two main cavities. Okay. And it's divided by this little thing that we see right here which is called the diaphragm. The diaphragm separates the thoracic cavity on the top from the abdominal pelvic cavity on the bottom. So here's my, here's my abdominal pelvic cavity, which is the green, okay? Which is green, oops, get green, get green, get green. And this is my abdominal pelvic cavity, okay? And my thoracic cavity is the blue up in here and it's separated by the diaphragm, okay? And that, that's the ventral body cavity. Now, all the organs in the, in the chest as well as in the abdomen are all organs that are in the ventral body cavity. Only organs in the dorsal body cavity, brain, spinal cord. All the, all the organs in the thoracic cavity as well as the abdominal and pelvic cavity are all abdominal, are all ventral body cavity. Now, you think that's easy? Yeah, it is. That's pretty simple. That's a piece of cake. Well, guess what? We're going to change that up a little bit. Okay. Oh, here we go. Now, a word that I want you to know. Okay, is viscera, viscera. And this word's going to come up a lot during the course of this, during the, during the, during the, during the time of the course. Okay, and viscera just means an organ. 
Okay, and the viscera are the organs that, that are all these organs: the heart, the lungs, the liver, the spleen, the stomach, the intestines, the pancreas, the gallbladder, yeah, 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 the bladder. All these are in the are are in this this ventral body cavity. Okay, just a number of different organs. Okay, and they're called they're called viscera. So if, you, if I ever say viscera in the course of the semester, that's what I'm saying. I'm talking about some organ in some way. Okay, now guess what? Take that thoracic cavity. Let's take that thoracic cavity, this area right up in here, okay? It looks simple, you know, but it's not. What happens is the thoracic cavity is divided into other cavities. The cavity right here, the cavity right here, and that's called the pleural cavity. So this would be the right pleural cavity, and this would be the heart there, okay? And this would be the left pleural cavity. So I have a so that that thoracic cavity is divided by a membrane that divides it into a right pleural cavity and a left pleural cavity. So my thoracic cavity is a pleural cavity right, right and left. That's bad. Okay, right and left. Okay, but that leaves something out. That leaves out this whole area right here. This whole area right here is called the mediastinum, the mediastinal cavity that sits in there. So I have a pleural cavity. Let me do that. And I don't think it's going to show up in red here. Here's my pleural cavity. Yeah, it does. Pleural cavity is the red area. My mediastinal cavity is in the middle. Now, what's in the mediastinal cavity? The trachea, uh, the aorta, uh, the esophagus, the heart, you know, things like that. They're all, and some of the great vessels that come off the heart are in this mediastinum. Okay. So that's called the mediastinum. That's right in the middle. Well, guess what? Plot thickens. There has to be an epilogue to everything. And what the epilogue is, is here, it's called the pericardial cavity. The pericardial cavity is a cavity that sits inside the mediastinum right here, and the peri means around, cardio means heart. That's the cavity that surrounds the heart. The heart is surrounded by a membrane called the pericardium, and that pericardium surround, just surrounds the heart. Okay. So basically, in the thoracic cavity, I have four cavities. I have a right pleural, I have a left pleural, I have a mediastinum, a pericardial cavity. So there's four cavities. One, two, three, four. Okay. And that's what we see in the thoracic cavity. So the thoracic cavity is not just a simple thoracic cavity, but divided into four other cavities. That's important because certain organs reside in different cavities like we talked about so far. So that's the thoracic cavity. Now we just have to talk about what's called the abdominal pelvic cavity. Now, again, that thoracic cavity which divides the pleural cavity from the other pleural, from the, from the mediastinum is a membrane which is called the pleura, which is a membrane which we'll talk about in a minute. It divides things off. So there are actually walls that are in there that divides the right lung from the center of the chest with the heart and the esophagus and the, and the trachea and the aorta and stuff like that, and then the, and from, the, from the left lung. So they're all divided in these cavities. So subcavities within that cavity, and they're well demarcated, they're well divided, okay? Well, what happens is then we have my abdominal pelvic. So let's go back to my diaphragm sitting right there, okay? My abdominal pelvic cavity isn't quite as definitive as the thoracic cavity. The abdominal pelvic, abdominal pelvic cavity is surrounded both the inside of the cavity and covering all the viscera, which you know, viscera, which you know, covers all the viscera and all the inside wall of, of the abdominal cavity with a membrane called the peritoneum. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. Let's talk about the peritoneum. But it doesn't really divide the abdominal cavity in the way that the thoracic cavity was. Uh, believe me, inside the abdomen, if you ever get a chance to crawl inside the abdomen and look around, okay, um, and before the police come, okay, okay, but if you ever get a chance to crawl inside the abdomen and look around, there are so many little nooks and crannies. There's little, little crevices and little places you can hide inside there, multiple places inside that abdominal cavity. It's because you can go through little holes in one place and you end up with somewhere else. It's, it's, it's really amazing. It's a maze sometimes inside the abdominal cavity. But when I look at the division of the abdominal cavity, I said abdominal pelvic. So there's two words there, okay? Abdominal and pelvic. What happens is this is an arbitrary division. It's not as, again, we have specific membranes that divide uh, the thoracic cavity into those four cavities. In the abdomen, we don't, okay? What happens is arbitrarily, this right here would be the sacrum, right there. That's the sacrum. The sacrum right here. It's the sacrum, okay? What happens is from the sacrum, going down in a dotted line down to the pubis, it's an imaginary line. Everything above that imaginary line 
is called the abdominal cavity. Everything below the imaginary line is called the pelvic cavity. So there's not really a membrane that's, that, that, that divides the, uh, the, the uh, abdominal cavity from the pelvic cavity, uh, but basically just an arbitrary line that divides the two. Okay? But that's what the abdominal pelvic cavity is. So now we should know about body cavities. We should know dorsal body, dorsal body cavity, cranial cavity, as well as the vertebral cavity with the brain and spinal cord, thoracic cavity with a right pleural, a left pleural, a medial sinus, and a pericardial cavity inside there, and the abdominal pelvic cavity with the abdominal cavity and an arbitrary pelvic cavity from an imaginary line from the, from the sacrum on down, from the, from, the, from the sacrum on down to the area of the pubis. Okay, and that's that. And we know the word visceral means the organs inside the abdomen. So everybody's that. Okay, now what happens is these cavities need to be lined with something. Okay, and what happens is these 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 cavities are lined with a membrane, and these membranes are really critical. We're going to be talking about these membranes every time we get to a certain body system. We're going to be talking about these membranes. And what these membranes are is they're called serous membranes. They're called serous membranes. What do I mean by serous membranes? Serous membranes are membranes that produce serous fluid. Now you're really confused. They're membranes that basically line and cover things, but they produce a small amount of fluid that's slippery. It allows things to move and slide against the other things with this serous fluid. So this membrane is there to allow organs to actually move a little bit around so they don't get stuck to something. Okay? They're able to move and slide a little bit. And what happens is serous membrane covers both the visceral and lines the inside wall of the thorax and the abdomen. And they actually line the inside wall of the thorax and the abdomen. And when they get to a certain point, they fold back on themselves. They don't stop. They just fold back on themselves and line the organs. They cover the outside of the organs, which means that the part of that membrane that covers the organ is called the visceral layer. Why? Because viscera means what? Organ. We talked about that in the previous slide. So that's that. We then have what's called the parietal layer. And the parietal layer is the layer that covers the inside wall of the thorax, chest, or the inside wall of the abdomen, belly, okay? And between the two, uh, there's, there's, you know, when the abdomen is a little bit more loosey-goosey because there's a lot of things floating, uh, moving around, not floating around, they don't float, but they're moving around. So there's a lot more free motion inside the abdomen, okay? But inside the chest, the actual the pleura, which is called the, which is the membrane that covers the lungs and inside the chest wall over the lungs, uh, they're, 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 it's, they're against each other. And there's fluid that actually sort of holds them together a little bit. And I'll talk about that in a second, okay? Let's talk about what these specific membrane names are. Again, that membrane that covers the lungs and the adjacent thoracic wall is called the pleura, pleura, okay? When you hear somebody has pleurisy, that means that they have an inflammation of that pleural membrane. Okay, and that membrane is critical. It's very, very important. Okay, and between the two, what happens is, is if I have a lung, let me just draw a lung right here. Okay, and just show you what it's like. Here's a lung. Okay, here's a lung. Comes like here, and let me just draw a trachea. A trachea. Oh, you can't see that too well. Okay, here's a trachea. Uh, here's a bronchi. It's a trachea. Okay, and here's a bronchi coming in. Okay, so what happens is I'm going to use a smaller pen. Here. What happens is the on the outside of the of the lung. That, that membrane covers the outside of the lung. So it's stuck to the outside of the lung, comes like this, down here. Can't go past the area of the bronchus. But what it does at that point, when it gets to that point, it turns back on itself. It folds back on itself, comes up this way, get down there. Get down there. Folds back up on itself and covers the inside of the thoracic wall. Covers the inside of the thoracic wall. Comes back this way, comes back around this way, and folds back and all of a sudden meets it should be meeting, okay? What happens? They meet. It's one continuous thing. So that means that in this little space between the two is a small amount of fluid. Now think about it. Every you ever uh, wash dishes and you have uh, two glasses and you have water inside one glass, and the other glass sits inside. You try to get the two apart. It's hard. There's a certain like of adhesion. You can actually twist them and turn them, but you can't pull them apart. Well, that's what happens. That little fluid, which is called pleural fluid for some strange reason fills a little bit, there's, and it's, it's not like a lot, it's just a thin layer, and it fills this little gap. This is called the pleural space between the parietal and the visceral pleura. The pleura that covers the, the, out, the inside of the chest cavity is called the parietal. The one that covers the inside, uh, or that covers the surface of the, of the lung, is called the visceral layer, okay? And, and, and what happens is when the lung, or when the chest expands, 
the lung will expand with it simply because there's like almost like a negative pressure or a suction that keeps the visceral pleura against the parietal pleura because there's a negative pressure and a little bit of fluid in there. Just like big two microscope slides, you put water in between them and you try to, you can't pick one off the other. You twist them to pull them off, but you can't put, you, know, you can't pull it directly up off the top. So the membrane that covers the lung at the inside of the chest cavity over the lungs is called the pleura. The membrane that covers the heart is called the pericardium. Okay, so if I have the heart, like this, oh, that's bad. That's I'm using a different color. So that still looks better. Let's do a nice bright red heart. Okay, here's the heart sitting like that. On the outside of the heart, there's a, there's a, the membrane that comes around like this. It sticks to the surface of the heart. Okay, it doesn't go all the way up to the top. It's up, it, there's a lot of vessels coming off the top. It's up to the top right there. Okay, when it gets to the top right there, it folds back on itself. Folds back on itself. Comes like this, around that way. Like that it creates a sac in there, and that's called the pericardial sac. The pericardial sac, okay. And so there is a little free space in there, and that allows the heart to move inside there. But the but the, but the pericardium that's on the surface of the heart is called the visceral pericardium, and the pericardium that's on the outside, this green stuff, would be called the parietal pericardium. The parietal means the outside, the wall. Visceral means on the organ. Okay. Inside the abdomen. Inside the abdomen, we have another membrane, and that other membrane in the abdomen is called the peritoneum. Now, this is a huge one. Have you ever heard of peritonitis? When somebody has peritonitis, it means the peritoneum becomes inflamed and irritated because of infection or something like that. And that peritoneum actually covers the whole inside the abdominal wall. It starts to cover the whole inside the abdominal wall. And when it gets to the back of the abdominal wall, it's interesting. And this is where the magic occurs. That peritoneum comes together and forms, it comes together like this and forms two layers that come straight out away from the aorta and the inferior vena cava. The aorta is taking blood to the vessel or to the organs and the vena cava is draining things. This membrane comes, this peritoneum comes together and inside between the two layers are all the blood vessels coming from the aorta to go to all the organs in the stomach or in the abdomen, okay? And then what happens is once it gets to the, the organ, that peritoneum wraps around the outside. So when we have something that, that part of the peritoneum that lines the inside of the down the wall, it's called the, hmm, go figure, parietal peritoneum. But once it folds back and starts to cover all the organs inside, it's called the visceral peritoneum because visceral means organ, parietal means wall, okay? And between the visceral peritoneum and the parietal peritoneum, it's called the peritoneal space which is filled with a little bit of fluid to let the intestines and stuff like move around. So that's called the peritoneal space, which is between the visceral and parietal peritoneum. So visceral, parietal, parietal's here, visceral's here, the space in between will be the peritoneal space, okay? Some things are called retroperitoneal, retroperitoneal. The word retro, retro means behind, means behind. So some things like the kidneys, Kidneys don't sit around, they don't float, they don't bob up and down like you get these pictures like you imagine. The pancreas isn't just like flapping around like in the breeze inside the abdomen and stuff like that. Uh, parts of the small parts of the of the of the small intestine called the duodenum doesn't move around. You know, the aorta and the vena cava, they're stuck to the backside of the abdominal wall. Why? Because that peritoneum packs them to the backside of the abdominal wall. They don't move. If they move, it's very little amount. Okay, and these things are called retroperitoneal. So if this is the backside of the abdominal wall, and if I had like the uh, the aorta sitting right here, the peritoneum would come over the top of it and pack it to the backside of the abdominal wall. So it's stuck back there. Same thing with the kidneys, same thing with the tubes that lead from the kidneys to the bladder, called the ureters. They're all what we call retroperitoneal. Retroperitoneal. Now this is just looking at the lung, okay? And this is pretty much what we showed before, you know, a little bit. Um, and this is like, this would be like the right lung, Okay, so here's the right lung, here's the left lung. How do I know? It's a little notch right there, it's called a cardiac notch. Why do you think it is? Because the heart sits right there, okay? The heart sits a little bit points to the left. But if I look at the purple, okay, if I look at the purple line right here, this line right here, that sits on the surface of the lung. It's right on the surface of the lung, that's a bad drawing, it comes like this and like that. And then what happens is that when it gets to this area, this, this area right here is called the hilum of the lung, hilum of the lung, it folds back on itself, and that's that blue line, and that would be called my parietal pleura. So my visceral pleura is the purple line, my parietal pleura is the blue line. There's a very small gap between that that's filled with fluid, which is called pleural fluid. This is just looking at, you took the, oh, this, oh, this is a good thing. 
What plane would that be on? That's on a transverse or axial plane. What plane is this on? That's on a frontal plane, okay? So if I look at that transverse or axial plane, and I'm cutting across this way from front to back, so it, there's a piece of the top and a few pieces of the bottom, you actually see the same thing. You see the, 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 the parietal pleura, and you see the visceral pleura. See the, uh, the, the only thing that I don't like about this is they change the colors. In this case, the parietal pleura is purple, where over here it was blue. And in this case, the visceral pleura is blue, where in this case, on the right, it was purple. Okay? But those are two membranes that line the lung. They're called the pleura. Okay? The ones that line and cover the heart, the pericardium. In the abdomen, peritoneum. peritoneum okay? Now, this is just a cadaver view. Okay? And basically, this is looking at the lung. You, you wouldn't be able to call it. I mean, to be truthful with you, you know, uh, cadavers are nice. I mean, they're, they're good. Um, they don't talk back. Um, they don't move a lot when you're doing anything. Um, but they don't look as fresh as you, you want. They look sometimes look like beef jerky. Okay? But anyway, what happens is this is the lung. And the covering of the lung, which they show right here, is that parietal pleura. What they've done is they flap the parietal pleura back. And they it it you right here. So right there is the area where it's cut. I'm going to move that out of the way. You see? So right here, they made a little cut. Let me just do a dotted line. Here, they made a little cut. Oh, it's not dotted. And they've taken the, the parietal pleura and they folded it back. That would be lining the inside of the chest. And in this area right in here, you can actually see the lung tissue sitting right there. And that would be the, the tissue that the pleura, or the, the membrane that covers the lung itself, would be called the visceral pleura. Visceral pleura. Here's the pericardium. This is the heart. This is another cadaver. We see, so we see a lung over here, we see a lung over here, and this area right here is the heart. But I can't see much of the surface of the heart. Why? Because it's in that sac, and the sac is called the pericardium, okay? The outer sac is going to call the parietal pericardium, and the part of that sac that's on the inside that covers and sticks to the surface of the, of the heart would be called the visceral pericardium, okay? So that would be where the heart would be, it's the heart right there. And this is just looking at the peritoneum. This is looking at the peritoneum. And what they've done is the, is the, is the, um, this is what they folded back back in here. This area here, this, that little tab of stuff, you can see a little tab right there, that would be called the parietal peritoneum. That would be actually lining the inside of the abdominal wall. What they've actually, what you actually see here is this is, here's the abdominal wall. It's, they flapped it up and lining the inside, all this sort of like greenish yellow stuff in here, that's the parietal peritoneum. It's stuck to the inside of the abdominal wall and goes all the way to well, once it gets to the back, it covers all the organs. So there's the liver. You can see a little liver right there, some intestines in there and stuff like that. And the, and the membrane that covers the organs itself would be called the visceral peritoneum, the visceral peritoneum. Okay? This is another just thing looking at the, at the area of the uh, parietal peritoneum. Here's the parietal peritoneum, that membrane brought back. And here's basically a, a, a small, a loop of small bowel right there. What would be called covering the small bowel? visceral peritoneum. What's covering the inside of the abdominal wall? The parietal peritoneum. Okay, so the parietal peritoneum is this membrane over here that lines the inside of the abdominal wall. You can see it over here as well. And then all the organs will be covered by the visceral peritoneum. One solid membrane, but it folds back on itself to make, you know, so it's, it, you know, uh, economically, I guess, you know. So. so what did we talk about today? We talked about some really important stuff. Okay, we went a little bit longer than I was hoping to, but we talked about some really important stuff. We talked about anatomical position, which is critical. You need to know anatomical position and the words prone and supine. They are very critical, very important words. They're used all the time. Prone and supine, anatomical position, important words. Okay. We talked about um, various names for things. Okay. We talked about the head. We talked about the uh, chest. We talked about the uh, uh, abdomen. We talked about the upper extremity. We talked about the lower extremity. All those names are critical. We talked about directional terms. My gosh, you know. Um, these, you know, if, if I was, you know, still going to have another kid, which isn't going to happen, okay, uh, not at 70, but if, if I was going to have another kid, um, I might name him um, uh, sort of Distal, you know, I mean, that's a, a great name. I, I love that name, Distal. This is my son, Distal, or something like that. And this is my daughter, uh, Medial, okay, or something like that. But what happens is they're, they're words you got to know. You have to know these words. These are essential words because they're commonly going to be in everybody, any medical uh, profession's terminology. You need to know those words. You need to know them. By far, you need to know them. I guarantee it, you need to know those words. We also talked about body cavities, dorsal body cavity and ventral body cavity. Dorsal body cavity, brain, spinal cord, ventral body cavity, cavity, thoracic cavity and abdominal pelvic cavity. Thoracic cavity, we know, is divided into four, uh, right pleural, mediastinum, 
I mean spinal cavity, uh, uh, pericardial cavity, left pleural. The abdominal cavity and the abdominal pelvic cavity is arbitrarily divided to an abdominal and a pelvic cavity. What lines these cavities? A membrane. What are those membranes? The line the, the lungs, the pleura. The lines the heart, the pericardium. The lines the inside of the abdomen, the peritoneum. The part that lines the inside of the wall, the parietal membrane, the parietal layer. The part that covers the organ, the visceral layer. If you know those things, you're in great shape. I want you to really want you to get these down pat because these things are going to be important um, all the way down the line. So hopefully you'll remember these. Hopefully you'll learn these. Hopefully uh, maybe you'll like them so much you'll even get like tattooed on your ankle or something like that, which you won't be able to use as an exam, by the way. But you could, you know, that's fine with me okay, if you're allowed to tattoo these. Okay. But anyway, that's it for this one. And hopefully if you have any questions, you can always ask me. Take care now.